Today's episode is sponsored by Liberty Language Services and its new sister company, the Academy of Interpretation, that launched in early 2022. The Academy of Interpretation is an online education and learning platform for the language services industry. The AOI's mission is to expand access to educational courses while establishing a standard of quality and professionalism. They do this by bringing language service providers, content creators, and students together on an online platform that's accessible to everyone. The Academy of Interpretation was founded to address the widespread problem of untrained interpreters working in the field. The AOI offers professional accredited courses for interpreters and serves as a platform for organizations to refer their interpreters for training. The AOI is offering Brand the Interpreter listeners a 10% discount on all courses using the discount code AOI10BTI. This code cannot be combined with any other discounts. But check out the episode show notes for more information about the Academy of Interpretation or visit their website at www.academyofinterpretation.com. Liberty Language Services is a rapidly growing language service company that recently celebrated 11 years of providing language access services. And they are currently hiring freelance interpreters for a variety of languages. To find out more about Liberty or to apply, Check out the episode notes. Ladies, what an absolute honor and privilege to have you all here today representing your own unique work groups under NCIHC. Um, this has been a long time planning, rather envisioning on my end, of hopefully one day being able to have conversations with the, the people that volunteer their time to be able to create policies and advocacy and just in general being able to advocate for us out in the in the field and in the industry so welcome to the show it is an absolute honor and I am so glad to have you here today thank you thank you Mireya. actually I'm going to name everyone that is here because you know not everyone may necessarily know so today's conversation will very much focus on NCIHC which stands for the National Council on Interpreting in Healthcare correct yes and we have different different people that are currently working under different work groups for the uh PERC committee right PERC standing for, we love our acronyms, do we not? <laughs> PERC standing for the uh, P Policy E Education R Research Right Committee. And so today representing or to talk to us a little bit about um, each work group and, and the work behind it, uh, we have we have, uh, you know, Marina, and we have Tatiana, and we have Eva, but we also have Linda Golly, which is the vice chair of uh, the committee. And I'd like to begin with Linda. Linda, if you'd be so kind, please, as to just kind of sharing how you got started in the language industry, where you're geographically located, because although we're here, uh, you know, in one place, uh, I know that a lot of us are in all sorts of different places. And then, of course, how that led you into being a part and volunteering your time with NCIHC. So if you would be so kind, please, as to leading today's conversation. Greetings from Seattle. <laughs> so nice to be with you all. It's always wonderful to see my colleagues. And Mireya, what a treat that we get to, to uh, be uh, with you on your podcast and Get to, new, get to know new people out there and hopefully invite people to come and work with us and send us their ideas, all of that. So this is a wonderful opportunity. I started out as a medical assistant back in the 1970s in California, and I've been mostly in healthcare ever since. And I've had the privilege of working with, with poor communities and 
included in that is a lot of immigrant communities. In the Bay Area, we had a lot of folks coming out of Russia and then in the early 1980s. And of course, the West Coast is a big gateway area. So where I live now is also a very rich area with lots of wonderful communities. Um, and so when I was working here at University of Washington Medical Center as the interpreter services manager, mm -hmm. I got to really work with the Somali community and the Ukrainian community and the Ethiopian community and patients who are Sikh and Cantonese folks. Um, so it's been my privilege to work with patients. And uh, I've also kind of carved out a niche with the deaf community here. We have a very strong deaf community, very strong in advocacy. So there's New York deaf patient groups and there's Seattle deaf patient groups. And they taught me a lot of lessons. <laughs> They were a couple steps ahead of me all the way, mm -hmm. but I feel as though the community has always led me in saying, this is what we need mm -hmm. in order to get good health care. <clears throat> we need to be able to talk to not just our doctor, but the receptionist, the financial counselor, maybe the EMT who shows up at their door to take care of them when somebody has a heart attack at home, that kind of thing, uh, disaster response. You know, we had terrible fires and we had Spanish speaking communities on the eastern side of our state that couldn't communicate with the with the people trying to provide them with disaster relief and take care of their injuries and things like that. So language access is a passion for me, as is healthcare. For me, those two go together really organically. Mm. And I've had a really good chance to work with National Council. Uh, with NCIHC since about 2012, when we started up the webinar group, which is train the trainers. So we know that interpreters need to be trained in order to acquire skills and knowledge, but who trains the trainers? So we set up a group to talk about um, didactic theories, to talk about content that interpreters need to learn. And um, had a chance to work with that group for quite a long time. And now it's my privilege to work with PERC. So we had a couple of projects in mind. You know, you have that, you have that passion for what if I had a magic wand? What if we could have a journal about language access um, in healthcare? What if we could have an annotated bibliography? Wouldn't that be cool? Um, what if we could have policy papers that we could post on the on the website and we had some but there's always more policy to talk about and you know we need to discuss those things so let's have a forum for those things and i love the perk committee um, because we get to do all of those things there's nothing administrative about our committee it's all content and ideas and we bring very different backgrounds so we get to really i think discuss kind of like pre-digest some of the some of the noise out there and hone it down into the pieces that that matter that we need to to really focus on. Mm -hmm. So that's why I love Perk and I invite everybody out there to join us. Yes, so exciting. I think that, you know, especially when you can hone in uh, with like-minded individuals and on one, one place, meaning, you know, the, the, a hub where all of this can occur, it, it's, it's just a different experience to be able to bring your experiences, bring that passion that fuels the work, and then share that with other colleagues that feel the same it, there's no there's no comparison, I feel, um, to be able to do that. And the fact that now we can do that no matter where we are, right? <laughs> That's definitely, you know, um, no reason for anyone to not be a part of something at this point because everyone can connect somehow, right? I'd like to ask you, um, Linda, your work eventually led you. you, you said you started as a medical assistant and then ultimately became 
the manager at this large hospital for interpreting services. How many interpreters uh, were you supervising or were you, you know, uh, had oversight? When I began um, in this role in 2002 at UWMC, we had only three staff interpreters and we had about 10 per diem interpreters who had no benefits, they had no vacation, they had no status whatsoever. Um, they kind of operated at the will of the organization. So one of the very first things that I was able to do was to regularize their employment and bring them on as permanent staff. And I, I um, used a special trick that maybe other managers out there can use as well. Instead of demanding full-time positions for them, I demanded half-time positions for them, which came with full benefits so that I could have more of them join the team as full staff. And at one point we had 43 staff interpreters reporting to me, which is, which is a lot to have 43 people reporting to you. But what was really important to us, as I said, we're a gateway state. And so it, we can't just have Spanish interpreters here. Mm -hmm. And we needed to have a Farsi interpreter and we needed to have an Amharic interpreter and so on. And so, but I didn't have enough work for full time in some of those languages. And so we went with half time staff positions and that way, um, it was really great because it provided a secure home for those interpreters and for those patient patient populations. Yeah, secure home and you know absolutely LEP populations. But I think the 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 feeling of um, being valued right as a language professional to be able to make that transition that was always a question in my mind, the back of my mind when I first started. If I'm here practically full time, why aren't I a full time employee? Why do they call me per diem if I'm getting called back on a daily basis, full shift? So, um, had that something like that occurred while I was still still at the hospital and the need was dire, I think absolutely I too would have been a part of that consensus. With you know, I feel valued. I feel my profession is valued because I valued my profession and the work that I provided. So what an amazing legacy to leave behind. I think that you know that's something also that I aspire to learn from all of you here is you know not only what fuels you and the passion that you have for the topic of language access, but you know bringing those those different passions together and how that fuels the work that where you're currently at. I think that's that's important for others to to hear because sometimes we feel like, oh, it's just one topic and that's, you know, we I've got to focus on just this, where actually we can fuse disciplines together or fuse, you know, passions together and and create something that's um that's very unique and very helpful for a lack of a better word for the profession, which takes me now to Marina Waters, because Marina is, uh, she leads the efforts for the policy work in the group, but she has a very interesting background, not so much interesting as, you know, it's, oh, it's out of, out of uh, character for being part of policy. I think that it goes connected, but mm -hmm. you didn't start necessarily as an interpreter, did you, Marina? Take us into or walk us through, please, as to what is your background and how and when that interconnected with language access and, of course, later on down the line with NCIHC. But first, tell us where you're where you're joining us from. I'm joining you from Indianapolis, Indiana, Midwest. I'm actually here at my office at Luna Language Services. I'm the president here. We're a mid-size language services agency for interpreting and translating. Uh, that's where I am today. Uh, but you are right. My background was not uh, first and foremost most in interpreting. However, I will say I grew up in a bilingual home. I'm Greek American. My father um, is from Greece and I was going back and forth uh, most of my life. So uh, I had that background, which I think is, is relevant. And uh, when I went out to um, 
educate myself on the West Coast in the US where I lived. Uh, I, I studied law and public health and I worked in those fields. I worked with indigenous communities in the America Southwest and throughout, the, throughout Latin America. Um, and so I was very much focused on human rights and the right to culture, language being a very important part of that. Mm. Um, and interwoven with the rights to property and resources. And, and when I moved to the, to the Midwest, I was, I was really burnt out on my day job as a lawyer. And I stumbled across really a wonderful opportunity to come into my lap of being part of what was then a startup of this language service agency uh, at a time here in Indianapolis when the city was diversifying so rapidly. And that business started a few years before I joined, but I came in um, 2003, 2003, yes. And so it's it's been a long time I've been here, um, but uh, when I joined, of course, I didn't know a lot of the field. I didn't, I didn't know because I hadn't been interpreting. So I I went to the law and policy to begin. So, so you know, I started with learning about Title VI, about the executive orders, about the lawsuit, all the things now that we talk about the core principles of, uh, of everything we're doing. But uh, for me, that was my introduction. And, and then I went next to the standards and expectations. And NCIHC was the only thing at the time that was out there. And so I was very drawn to it from the get-go. And as, uh, as, as Luna grew, um, we, I would like to think uh, we're on the front end of, of standardizing those expectations with our clients, with the hospitals we worked with. Um, I had some amazing partners with uh, the hospital administrators I was working with to help me understand the joint commission and, and, and to work together to establish standards for our interpreters. And, um, and it continues to this day. So I, that's how I got drawn to NCHC, uh, looking to others who could teach me to be a resource for me. And, and then realizing that you know, my background in law and policy did, it was a good fit for the organization. So, I was previously on the board. Um, I was vice president years ago, and I was always very jealous of the work groups because they were accomplishing so much. And everyone at the board, you know, we were, uh, you know, you're caught up in governance and um, finances. And, and I always was so impressed with the work groups. And so when I got the opportunity to step aside from the board and focus my efforts, um, that's where I wanted to be. Marina, you, your experience as a law student and later as a staff uh, attorney, um, yeah. you, what stood out to you the most with communities facing discrimination? You mentioned earlier with regards to culture and that you understood that language was a big factor in that. But in thinking back, once you actually entered, because there's one, there's mm -hmm. there's this superficial idea that some people have a general idea of what language access really is. And then once you really dive into it, you realize it's like this, I'm sure yeah. at some point, right, you did. So when you when you thought back and connected your experiences with these specific communities and then realized and dove into the language access law and policies, what did you discover? You know, I, it's, I love being in this forum and being asked these questions because sometimes you don't have a chance to reflect. And I, what I realize even just now is that doing community lawyering inside of indigenous communities um it's very much on the ground company work we call it a company network which which is meant like you you're not trying to dictate or 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 drive a community's um efforts you're trying to really be a conduit for them and in a way uh lawyering at its best is also being a type of interpreter. It's taking someone's claims and rights and putting them in a new language uh, for the courts or to governments to, to understand. So in a big way, you know, I wasn't an interpreter of, of language per se, but I was an in, 
interpreter, if you will, symbolically for people's rights. And I understood so well, I think, especially working with the indigenous communities, that they often were not fluent in the or literate in the language of the dominant language where their ancestral lands were. And so we were very much working through um, relay interpreters, even sometimes more than one. And I also understood how crucial it was to get as close to the original meaning of these words, even in my lawyering. So um, legal interpreters and interpreters at the UN where I was interacting were, 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 were really mentors to me. And so I think there is a connection um, that I see every day just in terms of being sure you get um, to the heart of what people are trying to express. Yeah. And we are we have the privilege of 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 um, helping those individuals live out their rights, right? Their rights to language, their rights to culture, their rights to healthcare. And, and so I'm sure everyone agrees on this call, but it's just a total privilege. And, and in some ways I feel like being part of this industry uh, is more gratifying to me than being part of you know, international human rights because uh, that was so slow moving, it's important. Mm -hmm. but these are daily needs of survival um and mm -hmm. so to me uh, you know i i can i can see the connection and i and i appreciate that training but i really do appreciate the work um that we're doing now fantastic yes and again mentioning you know how sometimes without us even knowing our experiences um can definitely interconnect to to make us even better, right? Uh, uh, right? For the purpose of the industry. And I think that thanks to that, look at look at where you're at now in with NCIHC and being able to help lead these conversations and efforts. Thank you for, for sharing that. Thank you. I'd like to move over to uh, Tatiana Sestari, which uh, for those of you that have been following the podcast know that Tatiana actually was one of my very first guests on the show. <laughs> and here she is, full circle. We're back now, uh, except now, of course, uh, she, she's here to talk a little bit about her participation and role with NCIHC. So Tatiana, welcome, first and foremost. Thank you. Thank you, Mireya. I'm so happy to be back. <laughs> yes, I'm so happy to have you back. Familiar face is always beautiful to have back on the show. I'd also like to uh, begin with you by asking, uh, first and foremost, your location. And then, of course, um, if you're not watching the video and you're only listening to the audio, Tatena has this great map uh, in the background. So point on the map where you're located. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you located, Tatiana? And share a little bit about your background and then how you got started with your work at NCIHC, if you will. Absolutely. Uh, I am located in Tampa, Florida. So it's very sunny. You see the reflection. <laughs> Even the map is reflecting the light coming <laughs> through the window. Um, I, I also started, I didn't start as an interpreter or as a linguist, um, uh, as my profession, or I didn't, in my case, I didn't go to college for that. So I started as a healthcare provider. I studied pharmacy. And soon after that, I started doing research. So I was more into, like I, I already had the mindset and the expectations of providing service to others but also empowering others for a better or a good health outcome or, you know, things like that, or, or preventing things that could be prevented, you know, in, in healthcare. Mm. Um, so that was my, that's my background. And when I was doing research, there was a, a change. That something happened there. Life put me in the language industry <laughs> and I, First, it was because I was always excited about learning languages and cultures and things that I'm only fluent in two languages, but I was always curious about cultures and different languages and how they come together and all that. And 
this was a great opportunity. I started as a as a as a healthcare interpreter, so this was a great opportunity to put together all these different passions, right? So that's how I started in this field. So I got trained as an interpreter. I practiced as an interpreter for several years, and then I, since I had this background also in education and research and pharmacy. I, I started to train interpreters and got into, you know, more of what we need to do as interpreters, out of our, our code of ethics, standards of practice, understanding all that, and now adapting what I knew and, the, and, and my point of view as a healthcare professional, as a patient, of course, and bring in as a, it now bring all that to interpreting and it, it all came together, I, I think, very in a ve very weird but beautiful way because <laughs> I was not expecting this at all. And as I was wearing all these hats or transitioning from one role to another, I started to realize that I could also advocate and I could also empower people, not only through my interpreting, but also through, um, through other types of efforts the same way I was doing it as a pharmacist or as a healthcare provider. So I fell in love with the mission of NCHC through my mentors in language access, one of which is Erica Shell Castro. She was, she was one of those who took me to NCHC. And once I went to the first um, annual membership meeting, I said, I need to go back every year. I don't care. Don't send me anywhere else. I just want to go back and <laughs> And, and, and learn from all these peoples and people and interact with all of them and find ways to work together so that we can empower those who, who need language access. So that's how it all came together. And at some point, um, I got involved in the journal work group um, because we were, I was helping put together the um, survey that came out several years ago to ask NCHC members whether they wanted a journal and what kind of journal it would be and the topics that we wanted to cover in that journal. And I was adding more hours as a volunteer, little by little, and then I came part of, um, came to be part of the journal work group, then the policy education research committee, PERC, uh, you know, under which, um, um, the journal work group is under. And then we started working on some of the other initiatives that we're going to discuss in a moment. And I'm now part of multiple work groups and, and also part of the board. It's, it's, yeah, a lot going on, but that's how it all came to. So to much that. great yeah. stuff. Absolutely. I think that, you know, um, you said it best, uh, Tatiana, with, with, you transitioning one thing led to another led to another and and i believe in your stories uh in the stories of the guests that have been on here when when you share the profession chose me because it's like this door open and this other door open and you know like everyone's just like walking into what they're not even thinking necessarily is going to be the end goal and it just opens up to the door to more and more things so um, that's, thank you for sharing how you got involved and we are gonna get in fact into uh, the efforts that you're helping to lead with, uh, with the uh, association. Last, but certainly not least, we have Eva here on the show today for the first time. And I'm so excited because I've seen Eva in, in workshops. Remember I was, I was telling Linda prior to hitting record that there was always people that I feel like, oh, if only I could have asked her this question about what she said, you know, like deep dive further into um, the individual, not just the profession. And there's always like, and we're done. And then the person was gone. And the podcast has allowed me the opportunity to extend invitations and get to know the person a little bit more as it relates to the profession. So Eva, I'm so happy to have you on the show. Welcome. It's such an honor to have you here. And if you would be so kind as well as to sharing where you're joining us today, and then from where you're joining us today, and how your career got started in the language industry or profession, and then how, of course, you connected to NCIHC, if you will, please. 
Thank you, Maria. And um, I'm so glad to share this opportunity to speak with you along with my esteemed colleagues and to all your listeners. So I'm so glad to be part of it. So my name is Eva Stiff. Uh, I'm a com committee member of the Policy Education and Research Committee of NCIHC. I'm an AVID researcher, and I use this skill to help NCIHC and the interpreters in general. Um, my paid job, because NCIHC is volunteer. <laughs> my paid That's job right. is being a refugee behavioral health state coordinator for the Virginia Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services. Mm -hmm. So I'm here speaking to you from Virginia. <laughs> uh, like many interpreters, uh, I first interpreted, then I trained. Mm -hmm. Right? So I know I'm not alone because many of us are started that way. So when I started to work as refugee state coordinator, I felt so many challenges and the biggest of which is language access mm. for refugees and for behavioral health providers, clinicians and counselors who are helping uh, the refugee population to which I am tasked to support. So long story short, a lot of volunteers and I, because there was no curriculum for training behavior health interpreters, um, volunteers and I developed and validated as well as standardized the Virginia Behavior Health Interpreting Curriculum in 2016. And I used all my knowledge, skills, and whatever else <laughs> you can put in there as a package to, to develop this curriculum. And what we found out is that behavior health interpreting is a very specialized field. Mm. And at some point, I decided to make a shortcut <laughs> because of the need, I taught the curriculum, the behavioral health interpreting curriculum to school interpreters, hoping that I can cross train them and then pull them to behavioral health. Lo and behold, how wrong I was, because it is only then that I realized educational interpreting is a specialized field as behavioral health interpreting. So I was not successful in that. So anyway, we proceeded to work with this behavioral health interpreting curriculum. And for five years, we have been using it to train behavioral health interpreting to support our system, not just for refugees, but for um, uh, clinical and behavioral health needs of limited English proficient clients. After we developed the behavioral health interpreting curriculum, I went back to the feedback of the interpreters, about close to 100 of them, <laughs> that mm -hmm. I thought I could pirate <laughs> from the schools and bring them to behavioral health. Mm -hmm. But anyway, what they told me and the lesson I learned is that uh, there's so much differentiation. And with that, um, silver lining, I developed the Virginia curriculum for educational interpreters. And so we have two paths now to train interpreters. So because of my job and the language access demand, which is really fun for me, I left interpreting as a service provider and became a trainer. So that's when I look for uh, groups or professional um, organizations that could further my interest as well as my understanding of what else do we need to do in order to advocate for interpreters in the interpreting profession. And of course, it led me to NCIHC, among others. So how I started with, with NCIHC, I started applying for membership and 
like many others, I just put anything that comes to mind. Little did I know and little did I realize that someone is really reading this application form. And so <laughs> they, they saw what I wrote about research. Someone contacted me and invited me if I am interested to volunteer as a research committee member. Of course, research is close to my heart. And I said yes in a heartbeat, not knowing really what entails <laughs> about being a committee member. So anyway, I work. Since then, I work as part of the NCIHC group, to which I am very proud to belong to. And we have done collaborative work and through the leadership of Linda here, um, we produced the NCIHC journal called Access. But prior to the publication of this journal, we, we conducted a study on the impact of COVID on interpreters. Yeah. And it was really a very nice study, which we tried to share part by part with interpreters, language service providers, um, even, um, even healthcare providers and stakeholders in general. Because our hope is that with what comes out in the research will be used for further research to advocate and ensure that we are we are we are advancing or empowering the interpreters to later on hopefully in the near future we can be all as one and be considered as professionals in this field so that's the long story of my life with <laughs> interpreting <Sorry>. at NCIHC. <laughs> so fascinating. Thank you so much, Eva, for having shared that. And I think that, you know, one thing that already stands out, and we're just getting started with today's conversation, is the fact that you have extraordinary women here with vast knowledge and experience, and that all come together on a volunteer basis. I just want to highlight that point here, on a volunteer basis to share their knowledge, their experience, and their expertise, and come together as one, all in, in joining the same effort, and I think for that same goal, right, which is improving and advocating for language access services nationwide. Um, and that is just admirable to me. And I, I again, I just want to share how honored I feel to be uh, in your uh, virtual presence <laughs> and be able to talk a little further about these uh, very specific efforts. So let's get started with that conversation, shall we? Linda, I'd like to go back to you and see if you would be so kind as to giving us a brief history about NCIHC and then of course, uh, you know, the, the PERC committee and what that uh, ultimately entails uh, in, the, in the larger scheme of things. Like what is its focus, its efforts, and what, do you, what, do you, what is your hope for the committee uh, while you're there? Yes, thank you. There are layers here. So I'm glad that we have a, a little bit of a chance to look at the layers. NCIHC was born out of need. Mm -hmm. What was this need? The need was, well, we started to have a lot of, of people immigrating to the United States with the language need, um, excluding the excluding people from Latin America in 1974, which was the end of the American war in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of people coming over. We had a lot of informal interpreting, community members, family members, um, people who were native English speakers, but who had worked in certain communities, um, either in the army or in a religious organization, who were doing this informal interpreting. But very soon, um, we had so many folks who needed health care that it became important to be able to have somebody at the visits. And in order to get somebody at the visits, it started to morph into a need for paid interpreters to make sure that you could call somebody who would actually be there. Mm -hmm. And only after that started, did we begin to think about, well, 
qualifications? How about standards? How about um, who's going to control these interpreters? Who's going to make money off of these interpreters' time? Because now we have a brand new set of workers and the language companies started to pop up as a way of connecting the need and the supply. The doctors and nurses and public health people need somebody to be there for them. And the folks who are willing to interpret need somebody to connect it. So the language companies grew up and performed this really important function. But those of us who were uh, politically aware at the time, we were thinking about, well, do we want this to be another capitalist um, situation where certain language companies could make huge profits off of this new opportunity and kind of squeeze everybody else out, kind of a monopoly thing. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to have organizations which were based, which were there in order to help language access that were not controlled by any specific company. Mm. National Council was specifically created to not be controlled by any specific company. Yes, there were definitely language company folks who helped start National Council, who put their time into it, who helped to create the, the policy governance for National Council, who put their volunteer time, um, provided infrastructure for it. Yes, they did, but, but NCIHC was never, did never belong to them. They were part of creating the structure that helped everybody and ultimately was there to serve the patients. So we kept the focus with National Council, we kept the focus not on profit, we kept the focus on making sure that language access is available and that it's high quality. So then we just began thinking of, well, what is quality? Well, what standards do we have? And National Council played this amazing role by going to folks around the country and asking them, there were, there were layers and layers of questionnaires that were sent out to people involved in language access. People like Tati, like Marina, like Eva, like me. And we were invited to say, well, what do we think is really important for interpreters to do? What should they not do? What, what should a doctor or nurse expect from an interpreter? What should the patients expect? What are the boundaries of the role, right? And that was a huge topic. So that took years to, to boil down to make sure that we created the code of ethics first. Mm -hmm. And then we weren't, we weren't the only ones to have a code of ethics, but we went through that practice and created a national council code of ethics that we were happy with. Um, and then we created the standards of conduct. No, standards of practice, excuse me, big difference. Standards of practice. So what, what does an interpreter do when he or she prepares for an encounter? How does he or she present to that encounter? How does he or she introduce him or herself to all the parties? What is the role within the actual interpreted encounter? What is what does the interpreter do outside of that very narrow role? What are the other pieces to supporting the patient? How far can we go? What pieces should we not do and why? And then once we had done that, which was another few years, we did standards of training. So we looked at, well, what, what should we expect from someone who is training interpreters? What kind of background should that person have? Otherwise, again, it becomes, well, who wants to make money off of interpreters, right? Because there's a market for training interpreters. Well, I'll call myself an interpreter trainer and I'll make money off of it. But who's overseeing that? Against what am I being measured? So we were taking these one thing at a time. So NCIHC has produced all of that without being owned by anybody. It is ours. It is our community effort. And the folks... Um, we, we continue to have people who are many different stakeholders. And I want to tell you who the stakeholders of National Council are, because to me, this is the key piece of why this is an important organization and why um, there's a place for everyone in it and we need everybody. So the stakeholders, I look at the stakeholders as six stakeholders. 
The first stakeholders are the patients and the communities who need the health services. Absolutely, they are the central stakeholder piece. All the rest of it is, is of no importance unless we're actually serving the, the needs of the patients and the communities for healthcare. The second piece is the providers and the care team. It's not just doctors, it's all the people who are patient facing and the people who create programs for the patients. Are they taking language, language access in mind? So those two, the patients and the care teams, those are the key pieces of healthcare. Those are the, that's the key relationship, the patients and the healthcare and the health te healthcare team. <clears throat> the third stakeholder after the patients and the care team is the interpreter. That's the, that's the language and cultural bridge between those two key pieces, the patients and the care team. Then we have the language companies which provide this amazing surface service of connecting up the demand and the supply. This is a very complex thing. And these folks operate with no recognition and no thanks most of the time. So I want to say, you know, thank you, thank you, thank you. These folks are critical to making healthcare access happen. Um, the fifth one is language service managers in the big clinic systems, in the doctor's offices, in the hospitals, at public health. Anybody who is within their own organization making sure that language access happens. So people inside a service providing organization, be it nonprofit, be it for-profit, um, plays a critical role. Mm because that's where we look at, is it being offered consistently? Um, and what are the standards? What are the standards within that organization? Because we can do it hit or miss, we can do it to check off a box, or we can do it really well, right? Mm -hmm. And the sixth group is interpreter trainers, mm -hmm. which is key. I mean, how can we have a service when, when we're not, creating, supporting, recruiting interpreter trainers. And I think everybody everybody on this call today has been an interpreter trainer in one form or another at one point in time. I, I absolutely love that role because it's changing all the time as we understand better what the patients need. And as the care team gets more educated in what they could achieve if they had a great interpreter. Right. In the old days, it was like, gosh, I hope I can just get somebody who can come and just do rudimentary in interpreting now. OK, well, we need to put a pacemaker in. Well, there's six different kinds of pacemakers and they're let me tell you the technical details and the patient in the American system. I, the doctor, I'm not going to make that decision for you. You have the responsibility of making that decision. So let's make sure you understand yeah. all of these six types of pacemakers so that you can make, you know, give me informed consent. You need a different quality level of interpreter for that, right? right? Or for a mental health visit. It's not enough to just do the, do the rudimentary. You have to be really, really trained for that environment. Mm. So that's National Council. We are made up of all of these stakeholders. And we're trying to lift up those stakeholders and show that they all have value and provide them with what they need. Mm -hmm. So what PERC is doing is um, we're trying to feed the need for these stakeholders by giving them policy papers. What are the laws? How is that changing? Um, labor law, we're talking regulatory law, we're talking all kinds of really technical things that these six groups of stakeholders need to understand in order to make decisions. We're doing the research, which was, we're just beginning. We, we sit down and we have meetings and we say, what do we want to know? What do all of our stakeholders want to know about? Well, we started with COVID, like how are interpreters experiencing the COVID horror, the COVID pandemic? How has their universe just changed? Mm. They're, did they lose their job? Are they terrified of going to their job? Did the location of their job change if they did keep their job? 
how do you stay at home with little kids behind you and you're supposed to have a HIPAA front, you know, a HIPAA, HIPAA compliant um, computer connection, right? Mm -hmm. But you've got your kids in the next room. How do you do that? So we focused on the need of one of our stakeholder groups, which was the interpreters, but we have six sets of stakeholders. So what are we going to research next? Well, in our journal, which we're working on the second issue now, we are looking at the specific stakeholders. And for each one of those stakeholders, we're saying, what do we need to know more about? So we're actually creating questions that we intend to either answer ourselves, but more likely we're putting it out there and saying, okay, guys out there, we need to know this. Would you please get on it and, and research this for us? Did I answer your question? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. And PERC is specifically designed to really hone in on these very specific issues. And, and it is basically a subgroup. Am I correct? A subcommittee, excuse me. Is that correct? Yes. PERC is, PERC is one of the non-administrative committees for national council. So any organization has really important administrative work to do like membership, like outreach, like running the, the annual membership meeting, mm. which is a conference of sorts where people bring ideas and things happen. They're important events. We don't do those administrative things. We do, um, we do looking at um, what do we need to know what, what do our stakeholders need to know? What can we bring? Um, what information can we bring to the field? W would you guys agree to that? Tati, yeah. Marina, Eva, would you agree to that character? Feel free to jump in and say, no, we, that's not what we're about. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna clarify that. Okay, so NCHC is the organization. PERC is one of the committees as Linda was explaining, and then each committee has work groups. And that's the next structure. Okay? So we have the four work groups. Correct. Right. So we have policy, we have education, which is right now <laughs> working on specific projects, which Tatiana is going to tell you about. We've got the journal. Which one did I leave out? Research? Research. 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 Yes. But they all play together. So what we do in research, we're gonna write articles about in the journal. What mm -hmm. we do in terms of policy, we abstract that and put that in the journal, right? So, and there's the website as well. So we take some of the work that we do that we don't put in the journal, we put it on the website or we bring it to the annual membership meeting or something like that. So all of these pieces are connected. Thank you. Thank you so much, Linda, for having shared. You know, I think that it's important that we look at the look at the bigger picture, the big player, but also then hone in on on these very specific, as uh, Tatiana shared, uh, work groups. So I'd like to begin then with Marina now um, to really talk about PERC and really dive into these very specific uh, topics. So in your particular case, Marina, we're going to be talking about the policy work group. So um, if you would help shine a light as to who's who composes this work group you know what what is the dynamic there of the volunteers in this work group and then what is the focus and ultimately ultimately for you um what you aspire to leave behind as your your work with the policy uh work group sure thank you um so yeah our work group um I won't go into the history of it because I think Linda did a great job of that. Um, I will say sort of one of our mission, if you will, uh, what informs our work plan is that we are looking for um, like to monitor and um, research really policy that impacts language access in specifically to healthcare. Uh, sometimes it, it trickles to other sectors, but really that's our our goal and, and to inform our members about that, um, to also respond to our membership about initiatives that they feel are important. Um, we always ask for that feedback at our annual meetings. Um, and I can give you some examples of the work we've we've done. Um, one I I I think 
is a great one is that when it became time to seek public comment for the Affordable Care Act, uh, that was a time when uh, we knew as an organization that that law was going to ultimately impact our industry. And so it was very important that NCHC had a voice uh, in that. And uh, policy at the time, we, we took a lot of time and really, really um, gave some substantive feedback that was in fact included in the ultimate in the ultimate legislation. So, uh, so that's like a big picture federal national issue. We might also get involved in very local issues again that are brought to us by our membership. Um, Last year, we, we researched uh, the California legislation that um, was impacting interpreters on the West Coast, and we spent months uh, interviewing those stakeholders and, and creating a, a, a journal article that we felt like described um, really different perspectives of that very big law that had the... It, it, that might impact the entire nation eventually. And I, I would argue that it, it very much will. So um, at this time, we're working on another really significant topic and we're looking at the really the, the lack of ASL interpreters and that are currently available in the field and, and how that's having a huge impact on language access. And, um, and we're trying to look at why, you know, is it just COVID? Is it, uh, you know, are there other, um, what's drawing people out? of their professions right now. And the reason that's so important is not just because, you know, the, the deaf and hard of hearing aren't, aren't having access to that, but also because it might be a beacon of what's ahead for the entire industry. And so we're really trying to, again, look at um, all perspectives of that issue. So I would say that those are some good examples of the work that we're doing um, both on a macro and micro level. The people in our work group, uh, we we recruit from our both from within our membership and also well no it's only within our membership I would say but it's not necessarily just people on the board it might be someone who who isn't connected to the board at all but is interested in volunteering their time specifically for policy so um, so we have agency. Um, representatives, we have interpreters, we have uh, hospital administrators, um, and we have both people that represent um, ASL and also other spoken languages, So, we, which we think is really important. So uh, those are a, a few of, of the elements and the topics that we're working on. Um, we are so pleased to be able to have the vehicle in the journal that allows policy to set forth the work we're doing. Um, you know, in the past, we were trying to do white papers and this and that, but really having that structure in place allows us to organize our work product um, really well. And I think, uh, you know, I will give it up to all of these women on the call to help. It, 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 it takes a village to really do anything well. And so, um, so I really appreciate how this group is organized because we do try to pick topics that will amplify each other's work um, and make it all a success, so. And is it usually topics that um, that are in your radar, meaning, you know, whether it's the, the, the group members that are seeing something out there, or as you mentioned earlier, are these topics that are brought forth by just general members of NCIHC that submit directly to the policy work group? I would say both. Um, we are all part of a, a listserv and we're listening at all times. There's times we survey the listserv, we survey the members, but also remember we're all part of it. We're all working in the field. So we know, we feel these issues. And so I would say we look for the pain points or the things that we are either hopeful of or worried about, and we want to be on top of it. We want to get ahead of those things. Uh, so again, so we can inform our membership of, of, of the issues and matters that are going to affect them the most. 
Are there any requirements to be a part, to be a member of the policy work group? Great question. I mean, you do have to be a member of the organization. And there's a process where, you know, you sort of state your intentions, we will interview people who would like to be a part of it. And I will say we don't necessarily just take anyone because we want it to be a good fit both directions. Um, and both for us and also for that person, because, you know, we operate in a, a certain way. So, but we always are welcoming um, new members and, um, and looking for some specific skills, in fact, for each group, I would say. So if someone wants to join, they can certainly um, reach out to uh, look at the NCIC website and it'll direct them to how to, to contact um, to contact PERC and be a part of a PERC or the work groups. Did I answer that correctly? Thank Linda and Tati, so did I answer that? Yeah, and I, I really want to uh, applaud what you said um, because you showed, you showed a side of us that's important to us as we do our work, I think. So I'm gonna say it again, because I think you said it, but I'm gonna say it again. And we do have a way of working with each other, which I call a collective. So I've been part of other editorial collectives and other research collectives in other organizations like Science for the People years ago and things like that, where, <clears throat> where the discovery is really key so that the whole point is to be able to bring in information from different people because people are going to have different information to bring mm -hmm. so we're not trying we're not trying to direct anybody to think a certain way mm -hmm. so each of our work groups the policy group the journal group the research group we all we have very spirited discussions we don't necessarily agree with each other mm -hmm. even on the big 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 principles but what we do is we put out the fact that there are different points of view and we try to cut through the noise and the emotion stuff and just make it clear what the different ways of looking at it might be. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think, a really important part of our service. We're not just a journal to put stuff out there to tell people the way it is. We're telling people what we don't know and we're telling people where there are different ways of looking at it at least to the extent that we can. Obviously, if there's five of us, we only have five opinions. We don't have 5 million opinions, but we do the best we can. Right. So when, we, when people come and work with us, then it's important for people to feel comfortable working in, in a collective um, work format. Yeah. Most definitely, yes. Thank you for sharing that, uh, Linda. Next up is uh, Tatiana Sestari again, and, and she represents, as mentioned earlier, the education work group. And so Tatiana, for you would be um, the same uh, uh, type of question. Tell us more about the education work group and um, you know, the, the, the work that, that you lead there, that you help lead there, and uh, what is the group, who is the group comprised of? Okay, so the education work group uh, was or started to um, was created um, to lead what we have now called an annotated bibliography, which is um, a cumulative of resources that are, you know, of interest to our membership or our language access field. And we're hoping to have that hosted in, on our website, the NCHC website. So it's, it takes a lot of time and effort to put together this product that we want, we want it to be great so that as we continue to, like as we launch it, then we can just have this great system to annotate and add the resources to, to our website. Mm -hmm. And that will be available to anyone, the, the community at large. And um, of course we need, volunteers and help because we're you know we're trying to get this um ready and be this this great um process but it requires a lot of efforts initial efforts to get there 
So that's the main uh, project um, in the education work group. But we also have some other, other projects that have to do with, for example, as I mentioned, we want the annotated bibliography to be in our website, but so we help those folks in charge of the website with you know, restructuring it, making it so that it's easier for users to navigate the website and to find the resources such as the annotated bibliography or now the, the, the journal or you know, those kind of uh, resources easily. So we're also involved in um, helping with the, the improvement of our website. That's so that's in brief, yeah, what, what we're doing in the education work group. That's like an online uh, depository of the uh, the work and and all of that, all those documents that we find all over the place on the internet. We're we're looking to centralize it. You're looking to centralize it. Yes. Well, <laughs> go ahead, Linda. There's so much. There's so much that's hidden. Yeah. So you know that word crypto. It means hidden, right? So there are crypto documents out there that are relevant to what we're interested in, language access and healthcare, but they might be hidden in the nursing journal of <clears throat> psychopharmacology. Yes. Which may be behind a paywall, or it may never come, it may come up on page 500 million of a web search, a web search right? So what we do, but what we want to ask everybody to help us with is to find documents, research, articles, blogs, memoirs, videos that are relevant to our stakeholders, which is a lot of folks, right? Patients, care teams, like <laughs> everybody in language access and healthcare. And we want to bring, let's say, 5,000 resource pieces bring them into this annotated bibliography, assign them keywords so that people can search for what they're interested in. And we will pre-digest them so that if there are three articles that basically say the same thing, we will choose one, but we'll keep the other ones in our, in our list on a different database. So that if someone comes to us and says, well, I really know, wanna know everything there is about this, we'll say, well, yeah, you got, this one here, but there is more stuff over here in our archive. But basically we're trying to extract from all of those crypto, the, all of those hidden places, professional journals, you know, the life and times of the millions of interpreters we have out there, the millions of healthcare providers who have written stories about, or who have written concerns about, or suggestions about how to do, you know, language support, um, people who think about dual role, people think about bilingual staff, people who think about better ways to train interpreters, things like that, newspaper articles. So we're just beginning and, <laughs> right, Tati? <laughs> I think we have 200 things that we're starting to annotate right now, but we're hope we know that there's thousands of pieces out there. Um, and we solicit people to send them to us by email so that we can put them in our working in our working file so that we can start looking at them. And we'll put the most useful and important ones there first, and then we'll just keep going. <laughs> Are there certain topics that you're focusing on currently that is very specific? You know, I mean, there's we so have... much out there, right? Like, so yeah. No, there are lots of topics that are all important. So <laughs> it's more like broad, the, the really best pieces in the broad rather than focusing on one thing and not doing anything on the other. Wouldn't you say, Tati? Yeah. And Ava, yeah. You guys are both on that committee with us. <laughs> I, I, would, I would say as well, it's important to differentiate what kind of resources we want to put there as a national council, which as Linda was explaining earlier, has no ties to yeah. ties to any specific company or organization. So it's, I, I'm gonna say autonomous, right? right. Um, <laughs> so it's not the same when someone is sending us a resource that is for training or it's a research piece or something like that versus, 
oh, we want you to post our website and then it's going through a company's website and that's a different thing. So I want our listeners to make sure they understand that we're, yes, maybe that website has great resources, but we can't just, as NCHC, we can just get companies' websites and promote them indirectly through this annotated bibliography. So it's more a neutral place to have resources available for our membership and our community at large. So it's not, so because I, you know, that's part of what we do in this committee. We also set the parameters um, to, to, for, for, for our audience uh, when they are submitting information right. for NCHC to post that information on their website. So I want to be, I want to make sure that we're careful about the message that we're sending out. And by saying that it's not just easy to, I mean, if I, if I put the website of one company linked to this annotated bibliography, I may have to do it for every single one of them. So we have to be careful about that too. Now, I I have to ask, is this depository of information going to be made public for anyone to access or members only? Everyone. Everyone. Yes. Amazing. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Santiana. Thank you for sharing that. That's incredible work because prior to hitting recording, I was sharing with Linda how difficult it was for me to be able to centralize information that pertain specifically to language access in public education. And I told her it was it was so hard. It was so hard to find anything. It's not that it doesn't it didn't exist, but it definitely took some grit and determination and really passion for what I was trying to accomplish to keep going because anybody would have been like, I'm done. This is too much work. You know, like there's so much research, like, and people not not being so open. I don't know why to sharing, you know, sharing the information of how to get started. So that's huge. And so thank you for, I mean, being a part of this process. That's going to be incredible, I think, work um, that people will be able to tap into. And of course, the people that actually created the work itself, right? Being able to finally it being merited somewhere and and what a place like NCIHC to say, yeah, it's going to exist here. Go ahead. I just realized I didn't answer your second question, which was about our, let's say the members, the volunteers within um, the education work group. And we actually have, we, we follow a similar pattern as the other work groups. We have representatives of the different stakeholders, um, you know, that, that Linda was talking about earlier. We have individuals who are linguists, you know, interpreters and translators. We have individuals from the industry, the different companies. We have individuals from hospitals, hospital administrators. We have um, trainers, a little bit of of everything. Yeah, trainers, a little bit of everything. Fantastic. Thank you so much for for giving us a quick insight as the work that, um, that you do and that you're planning on doing. Eva, you're so quiet on that end, on the other side of the screen. So I'd love to go ahead and transition uh, to you and be able to ask you the same question with regards to your research work group or the research work group that you participate in um, and volunteer your time in. Tell us a little bit about, you know, what what its focus is, what its mission is, and, and who it's comprised of, and what your personal aspirations are with this uh, work group. Yeah, thank you. I'm quiet because I'm learning. I mean, I've been with this group for years, and any time and every time they speak something, it makes me realize how little I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, See? you know, it's, it's really fantastic to be with, with a group that I belong to. And, uh, and it's an opportunity for, for all of us to, to share ideas and put it in a way that uh, it would be useful for the general stakeholders. Look, like what Linda said, we look at the landscape, we test it, we 
argue, we, we kind of agree to disagree and mm -hmm. come up with something that is most beneficial to everyone. Uh, when we work as a group, we don't look at our own personal needs and our own personal, um, probably we can say our own personal interests, but rather we are so focused in putting together a collaborative work. And that is very, very valuable in preserving the unity and the output of our committee. So the research committee uh, or the research subgroup is specific to gathering voices of uh, different stakeholders, but primarily for oral and sign interpreters, um, for them to, to share their voices, their perception, uh, so that we can share it with the general public for awareness, as well as um, uh, further uh, research application. Uh, as we all know, research is a very good tool for, for us to see what is the general trend. And so what we usually do is we look at the landscape as far and as wide as we can, look at the different features, and then pick out things that are relevant to our goals, to our objectives, as well as to the stakeholders that we serve. So when we pick out those items from what we can see, it doesn't necessarily mean that it is good as a proof. We lay it on the table, we talk about it, we make, uh, we make decisions based on certain parameters. So we, we synthesize things and create something very beautiful as a collaborative effort with a goal that we can bring something to our membership and to the interpreters in general, as well as the stakeholders that are supporting all these efforts to ensure that our interpreters are empowered and and the language access uh, the language access system is alive and is continued to be relevant and useful to all. Uh, our group membership, like what um, Tatiana has mentioned, is also diverse and we also need volunteers. Hello, someone listening there would love research. We also need volunteers because research, we can have research that are that can be done in short term, but there are researchers that can be done in a long term, but this needs a lot of people to work on it. For now, that research on COVID, on the impact of COVID on interpreters continues to be uh, a good, um, point of conversation on what we can do. What we believe as in the research group is that we collect the data, we uh, summarize the data, present it in a manner that is uh, compliant to academic standards as well as the scientific process. But we also want to make sure that this data is not expressing the, uh, the perspective of our group. And so we present the data, but we leave the interpretation, the implications and the conclusions to the readers with a hope that mm. we do not share our own limited perspective. There's just very few of us in the research committee. And if we believe that what we believe or what we thought is the is the best, then I think we are wrong in that because different uh, fields, different areas and different workplace will have different perspective of how to interpret data. 
So here we are giving them a summary of what we have achieved in our research, but we leave the interpretation and the implications and the conclusions to them. What we really hope is that through the research that we did, we will be able to steer the imagination and the interest of interpreters, language service providers, um, health healthcare teams, and many other stakeholders, even the academia, to keep researching and tell us more that we need to do in order to ensure that our interpreters are empowered and language access is kept alive and um, updated and useful. And um, they are in sync with what is needed in today's industry standards. Um, did I miss anything that uh, you asked us of? No, I have a follow-up question, however. Um, it, are there parameters for your research for your research work? What are you researching? For example, is it vicarious trauma or 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 what exactly it does your research entail? Uh, like what Linda mentioned, we cover as much as we can, <laughs> but the boundaries is always to the point that we are not favoring one organization or one group for that matter, but really focus on generating the voices of the target population. For example, in the past research that we did, it was really very specific to COVID, but there are like four different areas like technology, like employment, like what future needs are, are, are presented so we can be, uh, aware of that and we can look into further research so we can help uh, interpreters and uh, other respondents within that um, research that we have. The boundaries are in keeping with the vision and the uh, standards set by the National Council. We just do not create boundaries because we seem to like it, but we are making sure that the boundaries were set at uh, a level where um, we are compliant with the standards of the National Council, as well as the more, um, how do you say this? We are more inclined to, to adapt to the changing needs of the industry. Yeah, so creating the questionnaire is the key piece. Mm -hmm. And we really spent the most time on that mm -hmm. because you have to garbage in, garbage out. Mm -hmm. You have to ask questions which will elicit responses. You hope you're asking questions that resonate with the people you're asking. If they say, so, you know, why is this a big deal? Or why are you asking me this? You're obviously wasting everybody's time. Mm -hmm. So, right. So we were, we were already into the first year of COVID when we created this and two other groups had already done a similar thing, but not through NCIHC. Mm -hmm. um, so I had done one completely separately six months earlier, but now we're six months into COVID. I had done mine at the beginning of COVID it was no longer relevant. Mm -hmm. So by the time we got our questionnaires, questionnaires together, we were hearing this huge, in this echo room of everybody on our listserv in the different fora for discussion with the people that we know saying, oh my God, how am I gonna deal with this? Or, oh my God, my life has changed. Or, oh my God, I can't get an interpreter when I need one things like that, or how am I going to get training to keep my certification? Nothing's open. I mean, we were trying to think about, okay, how do we capture through a questionnaire what is happening and how it is affecting people? And so we spent, like Eva just said, there were four main topics that we did address um, to try to capture really large chunks of how this was felt by, how this was 
impacting the interpreters mm -hmm. being in the COVID situation? What had changed? What had changed? But when you say what has changed, you're also saying, well, what was there before as well as what is there now? So we, we were shining a light on what was there before, which you know, most of us know some of it, but we hadn't actually quantified it. So we were asking, well, how many, you know, what percentage of your time was spent on what modality? Were you remote? Were you on site before COVID? And has that changed? Were you, you know, a paid staff person and you lost your, you know, what changed? So it was valuable from two points, right? It's like, how did the world change? But what was there there before? And just by quantifying that, because we've got, you know, I think we had about 1,500 respondents, wow. um, not all of whom responded to each question. I'm sure Eva will, will <laughs> jump in there and say that <laughs> because she's, she's awesome that way. But we really tried to use the expertise of people like Eva, who is a researcher. She has, you know, she has the credentials. I don't. So I think it's a, a very fortuitous connection between us because we're putting the live story into numbers. And we're doing that by using research tools as well, you know, to the best extent that we can from our, our wonderful, you know, leader, Eva. Who, who sets the standards for us to do the research. So fascinating. Fascinating in the sense as well that you, like it's almost uh, as well like working backwards here, creating numbers based on stories. You, usually, you know, we, we've got the data, the numbers to create the story. In this case, you know, we need to go backwards, right? It sounds like you need to go backwards and, you know, collecting those stories in order to compile uh, the numeric data. I mean, I think the work that is involved, and this is but a small part of, you know, the organization, right? And, and, and I say small part lightly because I think we've all experienced the amount of work and dedication that is involved in just piecing something like this together and being able to, to work together and bring in experiences to really highlight, you know, uh, the, the work and the profession, right? And I think that that it's it's so important to to bring onto the stage what typically happens very much behind the scenes, all of this work and and you know your dedication and the efforts by so many individuals and work that is going to be left behind for generations to come for potentially the new language professionals that enter the field. And so it's almost like an, uh, an imprint, you know, that legacy that, that each individual, each one of you is leaving behind, but the work as a whole, I think as well, right? And, and demonstrating how when we come together, we're much stronger, Obviously, I think um, you know we can we can all agree on the fact that we're much stronger when we're working together. But I also wanted to make sure to highlight just how much work is actually involved <laughs> behind the scenes, and mm -hmm. and when people are talking about me included, when we when we talk about things like, oh, I wish associations could do this, or you know, if only associations could focus on that give the opportunity to say, and they need volunteer members to come in and do the work because the associations don't run themselves, you know, like that'll be the day. So that, you know, that just comes to show here, but a small part of what such a, a enormous, uh, uh, I feel organization on a national level, such as the NCIHC has done to promote, to advocate, to professionalize, to inspire, um, and to continue the work of language professionals uh, nationwide, and I'm sure that even internationally as well. I'd like to thank each one of you for the opportunity to have had this conversation, for you to even have come on the show, accept the invitation, and, and be willing to share, but a small part. Um, I really hope that the, it, it entices people to really take a more active approach in, you know, providing solutions to potentially problems that they've encountered out in the field by means of contributing their time uh, in the efforts of NCIHC. Before we close, however, ladies, I'd just like to ask one ask question and, and feel free, any one of you to, to, 
to go ahead and uh, share. What would you like to say to the general audience just with regards to what you're currently doing or about in CIHC or even, even recruiting to join and become members? Well, I'll start. <laughs> to me, when you like the work and you like the people that you work with, no matter how long, it doesn't feel like work because it's fun. I was going to say that don't think that your skills are not needed because they probably are. And don't look at us like people who are not mortal like you <laughs> because we are. <laughs> so don't make the same mistake I, I made, which was waiting for the right moment or maybe uh, being in the right position to start volunteering. All of us are needed, um, whether you're an administrator, an interpreter, a translator, a healthcare provider, a trainer, we're all needed and all our skills are needed in different groups. So I, I'll invite people, no matter what your background is, your, your, your skills are, there, I'm sure there's room for you in one of the groups at NCHC. I was going to say something similar, but a little different. I'll add to what Tati said is that no matter where you are in your career, um, that if you're at the beginning, middle, and because if you're at the very beginning, you're going to be able to bring fresh, fresh perspective. You're also going to be able to help inform the members that aren't in the position you're in. You'll also find some mentors that you'll just um, will be so enriching for your lives. And then if you're at the latter end, maybe you're slowing down in your you know, day job, but you're looking for a way to stay connected. And it would be such an amazing gift for the people of us to have more mentors and to have more people that have the long-term perspective. So you know, there's no um, requirements for how long you've been involved or you know, short or long amount of time, so. I will, I'm sure, speak for everyone when I say the patient care is the center of this. The, com the health of the community is not good right now. We want it to get better. There are so many ways to, to make it better at every level of our communities. And language access is a big piece of that. It, it dovetails with so many things. Um, so it's one lens. But really, healthcare for the people, we need to build it every way we can. And so we're, we're part of that puzzle. We're, we're putting our shoulder to that wheel. So, yeah. Thank you so much, ladies. I know that I learned a lot today. And, you know, words really do stand out to me. And today, the, those words were empowerment, leadership, community right? Absolutely language access and the passion. And I think that you all embody that. And I very much appreciate the fact that you were here with us today, sharing a little, a little more information about your work and the efforts of NCIHC, in particular, the work group of uh, uh, the Committee of PERC. So thank you once again for the opportunity. I very much appreciate you. Thank you. It was wonderful. <laughs> thank you.